السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبعد It's an honor and a privilege, alhamdulillah, that I'm one of the voices and faces that you are able to take some, uh, insha'Allah, uh, knowledge from with regards to your upcoming blessed Umrah. What an incredible opportunity, mashallah. 60% of those of you who answered the poll were uh, first-time visitors to the blessed lands. And I wanted to speak, insha'Allah, before getting into the detail of fiqh about the emotions of this journey. Uh, SubhanAllah, for many people, there's already things that you have built up inside you of what you assume you're going to feel or experience or behold on your way. <clears throat> and I want you to know that each and every one of us reacts in different ways and will find different things to touch them and to be of greater value than maybe others in different opportunities. I remember my first time visiting um, the blessed house and making my first tawaf, um, I didn't cry. And, you know, everybody told, you know, everybody, I was, I, I, I assume that as soon as you go to the Kaaba, you know, you're supposed to cry. And I thought to myself, as I began my tawaf, well, what's wrong with me? Why am I, my, why am I not crying? Um, and of course, you know, that's a, a, a presupposed thought that you have. And I want that to be something that even before you, you step foot onto the plane to head out, that your intention is carrying you forward for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking to come to a nearness and an equivalence between you and the best of you uh, as you move forward in life. You want to be a better person upon your return than your departure. And that isn't based on you know something that you're supposed to feel or a reaction that other people told you they had that it necessarily means you need to have it. For myself, it was, uh, you know, tiring at first. You know, I arrived and I'm in ihram and it's my first time doing it. And I'm trying to follow, you know, my heart, but also doing each and every step in the right way. And have I done something wrong along the way? And all of these thoughts, sometimes they come into, into play. And your moment with Allah arrives when it arrives and your experience may be different to the person standing next to you or to the person who you heard narrating to you their experience but i want you to know especially as you travel with us with daughter salam that the, the opportunity you have to find that connection the the purpose behind daughter salam's you know meticulous kind of um steps that they take and the opportunities that myself and the people who will be with you on the ground, the, the group leaders, the imams, the, the spiritual guides, it, it's all about giving you the opportunity to find your connection, that spark. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it a blessing. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to behold the Kaaba for the first time, that your dua is answered, that you remember us and your family and your loved ones in it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you whole and, and complete upon your departure as you wanted uh, in your arrival, Allahumma ameen. So there's a number of points that I want to get across with you today, inshallah. The first is, uh, I want you to keep in your mind that there will be moments where what you have read in books about, you know, the ideal umrah, are things that in life or on the ground are not always in sync. And that's from the beauty of our faith, that there are so many important ways to find our path to Allah that are all under the realm of the permissible or the wajib or the halal or the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And just that as you do your prayer, you might choose a different dua than somebody else has I want you to know that even in the process of Umrah, even in things like Hajj, that there is more than one blessed way of coming towards Allah and fulfilling your duty towards Him. So it's not one singular road that we are upon in our fulfillment of the Umrah. It is one path towards Allah, but there's many channels, many lanes, all in that highway of the Sirat al-Mustaqim leading us towards Allah Azza wa Jal. 
So there might be something that you might have read or somebody told you, or you should do this, or you should do that. And I want you to know that there is more than one opinion that is valid, more than one opinion that will carry you forward in approaching your goal. Second thing is that I want you to know that those who will be put in trust over your group and those who are embedded with you and those who are leading you along the way are people who are curated and chosen specifically uh, by you know, our wonderful organization, Dar es Salaam, who are there and equipped and ready to serve and are adaptable with the fiqh that we have been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, I want you to know that our sharia and the fiqh of our Islam has a solution for everything that comes into play. So you might come and you might think, oh my God, I have this unique circumstance. And subhanAllah, in, in, in my last umrah, one sister, for example, she had a, a particular need that causes or is necessary for her to visit the bathroom, you know, uh, you know, once every couple of hours. And, you know, uh, my needs are a little bit more specific, Sheikh. I can't be with the whole group. All of those kind of things, our fiqh, our, our team in applying the fiqh of Umrah will be able to assist you if you give us the news, if you give us the question before the time it becomes um, apparent. So that's the third point, that if you have a concern, if you have a question, if there's something on your mind, send it out in an email, let somebody know, let us prepare to provide you the best of comfort and the best of solutions possible through our fiqh and, and our knowledge of our deen of Islam, but also through our planning and ability to cater for you, inshallah. With that, let's begin our journey in kind of understanding the purpose of Umrah. The concept of Umrah is that we are performing a minor pilgrimage and to perform a visitation to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a confirmed sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And to do so more than once, may Allah allow you to travel with me and to uh, travel with Dar es Salaam more than once to the blessed land. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you Umrah after Umrah and inshallah for me and you, Hajj after Hajj. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he would encourage the Sahaba and he would say that Umrah after Umrah is a cleansing after a cleansing and it's a washing after a washing. It's a purification after a purification. And in one statement, the Prophet wasallam said that the thing that increases in our prosperity, in our rizq, in our enjoyment of what Allah has blessed us with is that we spend from it in that which is pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal. And of those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored us with and named by the Prophet sallam, is Umrah after Umrah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Umrah is not meant to be a one-off in life. It's not meant to be something that you do and say, I've ticked the box, I've gone. It's actually something that when you arrive and as you're leaving, you do tawaf al wada. You do this farewell tawaf and in it, you're making dua, oh Allah, return me again. And although I have just been there, you know, just under a month ago or a little over a month ago, my heart, as I'm sitting, sharing these words with you, is yearning to be there, yearning to have a group with me who I can mentor and lead along the way. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates that and that all of you, inshallah, uh, are blessed with a safe arrival. Allahumma ameen. So the concept of Umrah is that it is more than one visitation. You want to visit more than once. And it is meant to be a change of your circumstance. It's meant that it breaks the monotony of the, the normal routines that we have. It's meant that we're coming from a far distance as well to fulfill an act of worship that can only be done in that place and in that time. It's meant to be something that we hold as being sacred. And that's why there's so many rituals of us having to break the normality of our routines. So when you, you know, you wonder, well, why can't I trim my nails, brother? Why can't I, you know, uh, have any hair um, uh, taken off my body? Why is it that I can't apply perfume to myself? You know, aren't these things that are normally okay? Why do we have to alter it? Well, a part of the, the concept of Umrah is that you're trying to bring pause 
to that which you've become accustomed to as a blessing from Allah, to that which is normal to you, and you want to put yourself in a place where now you are becoming more conscious, you're becoming more aware. What am I wearing? What am I doing? When am I eating? Uh, you know, what scent am I applying or not? You know, all of these are things you begin to think about them and it heightens your level of conscious awareness of your dealings with others. I can't raise my voice. I can't be uh, vulgar with my word of choice. I must con control and con curtail and hold on to my anger. I must manage it and must do better than it. I must be forgiving of the one who's wronged me. I must, you know, change my whole mindset when in other times I'm able to be more decisive in this moment, I'm able to be more subdued and honoring to the tradition and the ritual set before us by the great patriarchs and prophets of Allah from Adam and all the way down to Ibrahim and revived through our Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So let's begin with the first aspect of the physical outward demonstration of our Umrah. Uh, there's a very small minority who are going to begin their Umrah from Jeddah. I, I believe the majority are going to begin from Medina. So for those who are coming into Jeddah, I just wanted to have one small word with you. Um, if you're transiting in a place before arriving into Jeddah, uh, you are welcome to refresh your wudu again. And you can do this on the plane, inshallah. I want you, when you hear me talk about taking a bath or making a, a ghusl or making a wudu or doing two rak'a prayer, um, when you have your physical ihram on and make your talbiyah, you might say, Sheikh Yahya, you know, I put on my ihram on the plane, which is, uh, uh, which is, you'll see lots of people doing it, right? So as you get closer to the miqat, to the place where we need to have our ihram on, and make our declaration that we are in a state of prohibited state of being a muhrim, that before that, um, you are uh, at that moment, you may not be able to do all the things that I'm describing, but you can do those in preparation before or after. So your ghusl can be taken, you know, just say you're flying in from uh, Toronto via New York, via Cairo or something. You know, you can make your ghusl before you leave home. You can trim the hairs of your uh, private regions. You can trim your nails. Do all of those kind of things before you set out on your journey. It's not something that needs to be done at the moment you're putting on your physical ihram or about to say your talbiya, your uh, uh, oral declaration of, um, of entering into the state of ihram. So I want you to keep that in mind. So let's begin, inshallah, with general for everyone, whether you're landing in, in Jeddah and straight on to Mecca or going to Medina, inshallah, and coming from Medina as a muhrim. Ihram is more than the physical. The first concept of Ihram is your uh, uh, intellectual and rational subduing of the normal habits of your personality. So if you are normally boisterous and you're normally loud and you're, you know, you're, 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 you're a person who likes to make lots of jokes and, you know, that's something where in my ihram, I need to think about that. If you're a person who's quick tempered, I need to think about that. If you're a person who's spendthrifty, I need to uh, think about that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm excessive in, in these kind of things. In your ihram, you want to begin changing from the within. Now, there are certain things that are prohibitions, and there are certain things that are desirable for us um, to be careful with. And when we enter into a state of ihram, it's not the donning of our clothes, but it's a whole mindset. And that mindset, its reminder is how we have changed ourselves physically, in particular for us as men. So let me speak with the brothers first, inshallah. Uh, when you don ihram, it's normally going to be given to you or you've been given the uh, two white uh, simple sheets that are not sewn together. Um, ihram, the concept of ihram is that it is not clothing. It's not something you normally wear. Now, it was at the time of the Prophet that they would wear uh, a rida and a izar, which is a top sheet and a waist cloth. And that's, you know, subsi a subsistence um uh, societies and farmers, uh, even until now, that's a normal 
kind of dress and habit, whether you're from the heartlands of Africa or Southeast Asia and in other places. Uh, the Lungi or, um, you know, uh, different names for it in different places, Maghawis for the Somalis and so on. Um, but for the Arab, it was called Rida and Izab. So it's normal attire for them. But for us, it's a big change. And it's the only thing that we could wear, and we can't wear any, anything as men that is sewn. So that includes undergarments, that includes um, us wearing a, a hat or something on top of our head, anything that is sewn. And you can't even cover your, your head with your own ihram, whether it's cold or sunny and so on. You can use an umbrella, but nothing that's actually on top of your head. Those are words of the Prophet you should not um, veil your face, but if it is required for medical reasons or for you know wearing a face mask because of uh, the, the large numbers, then the ulama have given its permissibility. But generally speaking, covering the face, covering the hands with a glove, wearing things that are sewn, undergarments are all uh, not accepted when you are finally in the state of al-ihram. So, Donning on the two white sheets, putting on um, uh, that does not enter us into ihram. What effectively enters us into ihram is that we come to a place which has, which has been marked for us by the Prophet Sallallahu as being an area that, that as you cross it, you must declare that I am now coming to serve Allah. I'm not coming initially for trade or commerce or to get married or to fight, you know, all of those are kind of things that I'm allowed to buy food. I'm allowed to do these kind of things. But my purpose is I have come, oh my Lord, to serve for Umrah. I may have business meetings after my Umrah, but my purpose initially is to fulfill this Umrah, oh Allah. For our sisters, you're able to wear your normal abaya. You must wear and fulfill the general precepts of hijab which is something that is wide, something that is opaque, it's not see-through, something that is not perfumed, something that is not the clothing of worship of other faiths. Uh, you know, you can't wear um, something that other traditions have values for. Uh, it's something that doesn't resemble the clothing that is only known as the clothing of men. And it's something that is worn as a sign of your humbleness and humility before Allah Azza wa Jal. Now that could be of any cultural background, any shape or color, but generally what is the norm is white and black so that you don't stand out and that you don't have libasu shuhra, something that is ostentatious and attra you know, attracting uh, attention when you're there seeking humbleness and humility in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're permitted to wear uh, you know, your normal jubas and so on with your scarf, with your hijab and, and, and your socks and your sh you know, uh, shoes as, as is normal. For our brothers, it's the, the two sheets. And for your footwear, we're not allowed to wear shoes that are completely enclosing uh, our feet. Uh, the instep or the top of your foot must show and a part of the back of it can show. Now, other than that, you can wear, you know, you can wear Crocs, you can wear uh, Adidas, you can, you know, whatever it is that's fine. And as long as it has um, a part of the top of your foot showing, uh, you know, you can have your toes hidden or showing, both of them are accepted, and a part of your heel, inshallah. Uh, that is the general state of your physical resemblance of ihram for men and women. Now, you're not yet a muhrim until you make your niyyah. And I recommend for you that you don't do it early on because uh, you want to be comfortable. You want to be able to have your normal conversations. And, you know, uh, sometimes we slip with our anger and so on. So the later you enter into ihram, the better it is so that you preserve your status as uh, a person in the state of Umrah. And on the airline, if you're landing in Jeddah, they will let you know we are 20 minutes away. We are an hour away. They will give you more than one warning. Do pay attention of it to it. Let the steward know that if I'm asleep, please wake me up. I'm going to be in Umrah. I want, I want to be woken and roused in case you do fall asleep, inshallah. How do you enter into Umrah? It's a really simple sentence. There's only few words that you have to memorize. And this is one of them. And it'll be with you on a small booklet uh, that's provided for you. 
Uh, and I know there's so many resources that you can turn to. It's simply three words. Labbaika, I have come, O oh Allah, to serve. Allahumma, my Lord, Allah alone. Bil Umrah, with Umrah. Now, if you are um, uh, worried that you may not be able to complete your Umrah, or if there is something that is going to deter you, there is a short statement, فَإِنْ حَبَسَنِي حَابِسْ uh, fa, if, if I am deterred or if something happens, if an emergency causes me not to be able to fulfill my uh, Umrah, فَمَحَلِّي حَيْثُ حَبَسْتَنِي Then my Umrah will come to an end at the place where that emergency happens. Now, that's something that sisters who are worried about their menstrual cycle coming in, and I'm not sure if it's going to be in the right timing. That's one way of you ensuring that if it does arrive and you're not able to complete your umrah thereafter, that your reward is guaranteed because it is a condition sent for you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that should give you comfort that the mercy of Allah is so great. Your, your reward for umrah is assured and your actions, inshallah, are fulfilled. Now, that's something that um, uh, we can send you in, in, in documentation and so on. And it's something that you, I can share with you later and, and our team with you, inshallah. Uh, from that moment, you want to celebrate your umrah. So you're going to be increasing with your talbiyah. لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَّيْكَ إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ وَالنِّعْمَةَ لَكَ وَالْمُلْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ Which is, I am here, O oh Allah. I'm in response to your call, to your invitation. I'm here because of your mercy upon me for carrying me here. I'm here, you've given me this hidayah to make this choice. Other people have gone here and there, but I'm coming here, O oh Allah, to serve you. This is the purpose why I am here. There is no one that is equal to you and no partner is there to be shared with you, O oh Allah. You are the only one who is worthy of praise for you are the giver of grace and you are the one who has sovereignty and power and authority belong only to you, O oh Allah. La sharika lak. No one has a share in that with you, O oh Allah. Now the statement of this uh, albiya is to remind you why you are here and who it is that you are serving. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are here and centered for. From the moment you've made that talbiyah, labayk Allahumma labayk, from that moment on, you will not cut any part of your hair, whether it's body hair or from, from, your, from your scalp you will, or your beard. You will not um, trim your nails. You will not perfume yourself. Now, one of the things that a lot of people always ask about, Sheikh, what about soap? Uh, we normally don't use soap for perfuming ourselves, or if the stewards, they gave you a towel and had a small scent of lemon. It's not for perfuming yourself, it's for cleansing yourself. Generally speaking, if you can go without it, it's better to go without it. Do not apply anything to yourself to change your scent in that sense, to perfume yourself. But things that are incidental, you know, I went into the bathroom and I, they only had soap and I need to wash my hand with soap. That's incidental, it's accepted, it doesn't ruin your ihram, it doesn't take away from your reward. It's not something that you have to worry about. Uh, for things like deodorant, you, I would prefer for you to buy um, uh, the child-friendly, uh, no perfume uh, deodorant, no perfume soaps. You can get goat milk soap, soap if you want, if you want to be very uh, specific, inshallah. All of that is fine, um, inshallah. You can get goat's milk, uh, shampoo, um, just in case you do have a refresher before you finish your umrah, inshallah. Uh, you're not going to wear gloves. Uh, you're not going to have any intimate contact between husband and wife. So my dear, beautiful couples, mashallah, we're coming to umrah, husband and wife together, and you want to hold hands and make your make your uh, tawaf, you know, uh, Push that aside, inshallah, you can hold hands to keep together, and, but none of that, uh, you know, lovey-dovey stuff, inshallah, save that for uh, after the umrah is complete, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Uh, we do not, of course, have any conjugal visits. We don't have any intimate contact. There's no uh, kissing and hugging and holding, and we uh, don't make any uh, marriages and, and things while we're in a state of ihram. 
uh, we don't contract them or, or fulfill uh, for them. And we are making sure that we don't bring any harm to anything, wild animals, uh, the birds in the haram. You know, we're meant to be in a consecrated state, aware of everything that is around us. Some uh, things that are specific for men um, is that we don't cover our heads as men and we don't wear anything that is sewn uh, that uh, gives a detail of the shape of the body, right? Uh, so no pants, no undergarments and things like that. For sisters, even if you wear niqab, it is better for you not to wear, uh, uh, it is, uh, was ordered by the Prophet Sallallahu even upon his wives, uh, not to wear their niqab. If they felt somebody was, you know, constant at looking at them and they couldn't, you know, turn away or whatever, then you can drop down something but it's not something that you maintain with you all throughout. And that is the tradition of our ihram. The purpose of ihram is to heighten our senses of everything around us. How do we enter, um, you know, when we enter the masjid and when we begin the umrah, the next aspect of it is as you arrive uh, into Mecca and Mukarrama, you're now in a state of ihram, you are celebrating the praise of Allah, you are humbled before him, you are raising your voice in your dua, you're reminding others of your talbiya, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, and it's a sunnah for men to raise their voice that another can hear, and it is sunnah for women to repeat it that they themselves can hear and somebody near them can hear. They don't, they're not excessive, excessively loud with it. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik. The normal habit is, is that you will settle into the hotel you, you may have a bath, you're allowed to bathe when you're in a state of ihram, you're allowed to change from one ihram, physical ihram to another, that's for men and women, you're allowed to, um, you know, refresh your wudu, you don't have to stay in the same clothes all throughout or in the same ihram all throughout, so uh, that's something that is acceptable inshallah, uh, obviously you are not to, you know, don't comb your hair, don't, you know, don't do things that may produce uh, something that will break part of your ihram or take some of its reward by intentionally removing hair from your body. Now, if you do, for example, forget and you rubbed your beard or something and hair fell out or you know, some of our sisters, some of their hair is falling out, this non-intentional, you're not cutting from it, you're not getting a haircut, you're not trimming your nails, none of that is of consequence, don't worry about it. It does not take any um, uh, of your reward from your ihram, inshallah. You will be assigned group leaders. You'll be assigned a time to meet, where to meet, and you will head out to your umrah, inshallah. Uh, it is the norm that um, there will be people along the way who will go ahead. They know they've done it two, three times, and they're comfortable. For those of you who want to be mentored along the way, do wait for the group, inshallah. It is a positive environment and experience. You're welcome to eat and drink and do all of those wonderful things. Now, uh, as you are getting yourself ready to enter into the Masjid al-Haram, I want you to know that all of Mecca that is known as the Haram is part of the Masjid. So every part of it, even outside on the street, is meant to be treated with a level of dignity and grace. Be careful with your treatment of others in it, inshallah. How do we enter the masjid? Is that we enter it like any other masjid. There is no particular dua that you must say the moment you see the Kaaba, or there's a particular dua that I've entered, um, you know, into the masjid al-haram. This is what I have to say. What is said by some of the Sahaba was that they made tak takbir. They would say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And they would make dua for the masjid. They would say, Allahumma azlim hadha bayt. Oh Allah, magnify and make magnificent this, this uh, house of your worship. So they would extol, uh, asking Allah to protect it. Allahumma ja'alhu baladan amina. Oh Allah, make it a safe and secure land. So that's recorded from the ulama of the past, from the tabi'een and the sahaba. But there is no particular dua except to say, Allahumma iftah li abwaab rahmatik. Oh Allah, open to me the gateways and the doorways of your mercy as you enter. When you enter, it is beautiful when you first experience the Kaaba to make dua. It's not a must that you stop and make dua. But if you have an opportunity, 
take a moment and begin making dua. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any language that you are comfortable with to honor you and uplift you and support you and hail you and, and forgive you and all of us, Allahumma ameen, and make your dua to Allah. Normally when we come down to um, the matat, which is the place of tawaf, you're going to come behind where the black stone is. And the black stone is where we begin our tawaf. The black stone is a place that is honoring to the believers to approach it and to come close to it and to begin their tawaf from it. What's significant about the black stone, it's that it's one of the last, it is the last rock from the initial building of the Kaaba since the time of Adam. Now, all of the rocks and the stones and the bricks that make up the Kaaba that are there today, other than the black stone, the vast majority of them over the ages since the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they have been rebuilt six or seven times. But the black stone remains encased in an amber resin. It's a very small number uh, of parts of that stone that are uh, that are encased in that amber and that are sealed within that silver case, inshallah. Um, you are not going to um, begin your tawaf by touching it or kissing it. You're going to be a little bit further away and as you get to um, parallel with it, you're going to indicate with your right hand and you say, Allahu Akbar. One time is sufficient. Allahu Akbar. And you begin your tawaf. There is no particular dua that is known from the Prophet ﷺ in his tawaf, except that he would make the magnificence of Allah known. So he would say, Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. The Prophet uh, taught us to magnify Allah. The places of tawaf is not necessarily to ask Allah for things. So the dua that you're making is the dua of magnif magnifying Allah, honoring Allah, extolling praise upon Allah, up, you know, uh, letting, letting yourself, you know, uh, prove to yourself with Allah that you are here for him. So as you're making this tawaf, the, the inner uh, meaning of it, according to Imam al-Ghazali, is that as with life, you begin and end in the same place. You entered this world weak and you will leave it weak. You entered into this world without your choice and you will leave when it's not your choosing. You entered into this world humbled by Allah and you will return to that place. So as you go around and make one first full circuit, Remember the, the cycle of your life, that you are here and you want to improve in your life. You want as you come back that I'm going to become better. As I'm returning back home where I came from, I want to be better than I was when I first arrived. So keep all of that in mind, inshallah. Um, for men, we remove, this is where you will remove your ihram and let your right shoulder be witnessed uh, by others. And it's for the seven tawaf. Uh, there's no change uh, in the attire of our sisters. And in the first three circuits, if you are able to jog, do so. Usually it's a little bit crowded and you don't want to be bumping into other people. So sometimes it's just a slower pace, inshallah. But if you're able, you are welcome to do so. And you go around the Kaaba seven times. Each time you come to the black stone, Allahu Akbar. So one to seven, and you end at the black stone, and you continue heading out, having fulfilled this great, uh, you know, second pillar of the Umrah. The first being in Ihram. Now number two is having fulfilled seven circuits around the Kaaba. Anytime you want to make tawaf after your Umrah, your tawaf is going to be just that. Seven circuits around the Kaaba, and it comes to an end with two rak'ah, behind the station of Prophet Ibrahim or anywhere in the masjid. And a lot of people, you will see them, they're quite callous, may Allah forgive them. They'll stand in a place where people are making tawaf and you know the, the officers are trying to get them to stand up. Don't do that. Go a little bit further back. Don't be a hindrance to others in their umrah. Your reward will be greater even if you are a little bit further away, inshallah. Keep that in mind, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. You're going to pray two rak'ah, in the first raka'ah, in the second raka'ah, short surahs that all of us know. And 
and it's at that moment, if you have Zemzem nearby, there's lots of uh, water troughs for you to take some Zemzem, drink it and make dua. This is a great sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu that after you finish the seventh tawaf, you pray two rak'ah and you make dua to Allah. I have completed this tawaf, oh Allah. I am completing my umrah and oh Allah, give me strength to finish the rest of it. Make dua for yourself and your home and your family and your community and your education and your masjid and those who are living and those who have passed away and for your rizq and for your job and for your children who are not yet born into the world. Make dua and dua and dua uh, and be pleased with knowledge that your dua will be answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is also, as you make your tawaf, a dua that was known from the Prophet ﷺ where he would say, Rabbana, atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. As you come closer to the black stone, in between the Yemeni corner and the black stone, and that will be indicated to you by those who are assisting you, inshallah, in the fulfillment of the Umrah. The third aspect of your Umrah, and you're more than halfway there now, is the sa'i. Sa'i means the hurried run or the completion of the run between the mountain of Safa, which is going to be right behind you on the right-hand corner. As you move away from the Kaaba, it'll be to your right on the right-hand side. You're going to go down through a small opening and up a little bit of an incline towards a Safa. And as you get to a Safa, you're going to turn and look towards the Kaaba. And you're going to make the dua, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. It begins by you reciting in the first one, Inna safa wal marwata min sha'airillah. It's not essential that you recite it, but that was something done by the Prophet. ﷺ. It is a sunnah. It's also written there for you if you would like, and you can have it on a piece of paper. And then you will make your takbir, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah wahdahu. لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت وهو على كل شيء قدير لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له أنجز وعده ونصر عبده وهزم الأحزاب وحده You make this dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that reminds you that only Allah is worthy of your worship, that it is here that you have come to serve Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that you are seeking only from Allah help. Now, remember I told you in tawaf, it's not necessarily the place of making dua, asking for things. You were making dua, magnifying Allah. Here is where you ask of Allah's blessing. This is where the Prophet stopped and began to make dua to Allah. And after he made that dua, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, after he made that dua, then he began to make dua for himself and his family and his first ummah and his community. Then he repeated it again. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. Wahdahu la sharika lah. Yuhi lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd. Yuhi wa yumit wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. La ilaha illallah. Wahdahu la sharika lah. Anjaza wa'dahu wa nasra abdahu wa hazam al-ahzaba wahda. After he makes that, he then again makes dua for himself. And he repeated this three times. Now, the reason for that, this is the place of Hajar alayhi salam. This is where her needs were met by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She was left alone by Ibrahim and now she's hungry and thirsty and they're going to die. So she climbs the mountain and she searches for water and she does not find it. She makes dua to Allah. I have none but you, O Allah. And with that sincerity, she runs from this mountain to the next to the, and back and forth and back and forth seven times until finally her sincerity is at its peak and Allah sends the angel of Jibreel and the uh, well of Zamzam is uncovered for her. That is the state that you want to recreate in following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You want to ask Allah as if you are certain that Allah will answer you, that your dua is heard by Allah and that you have complete tawakkul and reliance upon Allah there is none but you that I can ask these things from except you, O Allah. You begin on the mountain of Safa one time to Marwa. That's one. Returning back to Safa is two. Going back to Marwa, three. Going back to Safa, four. Going back to Marwa, five. 
going back to Safa 6 and you end at Al Marwa. In Al Marwa, you do the same dua that you did at Al Safa. You stop and you face the Kaaba and you raise your hands up and you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment you finished your seventh one at Al Marwa, you are now just about done your Umrah. The last thing is to trim the hair, shave the hair for men, or to trim from the hair for women. And for women, you are going to bundle your hair into um, maybe a ponytail, and you're going to take about a centimeter, a centimeter and a half from it, about the size of your uh, small little uh, 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 pinky uh, index there, small part of it. That's the amount that you would take, inshallah. And it's a small amount that you would uh, cut from your head. It is preferable for men to shave, but it is acceptable for them to shorten. And you would do that at the barber shop. They're uh, going to be indicated to you as you're walking out of the haram. You'll find lots of people who will say, you know, haircut, let me show you where to go. Um, its cost is 10 rial for a shave, 15 rial for a trim. And they do a relatively good job that you will be presentable enough. You're able to cut for yourself. You're able to cut for others. If you want to use your own equipment, you're welcome to do so back in your hotel room, inshallah. And as you finish, as you are leaving, you make the dua of leaving the masjid. Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. Oh Allah, I ask you to grant me acceptance. May Allah accept your umrah. Allahumma ameen. With that, of course, is the visit to the Masjid of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Your Umrah has come to an end once you have trimmed your hair. You are now out of the state of Ihram and you are now able to rejoin um, with your normal functions in, in habitation with your spouse and all of those other things. But you are still in a state of higher consciousness in, in the Masjid of Mecca. Uh, all of Mecca, as we said, is part of the sanctuary. You are not to use bad words. You are not to be injurious to anything or animals. You are to be careful not to be vulgar or uh, sinful in any way. So that is a higher state of consciousness, inshallah. Uh, secondary to that is visiting the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's masjid, one prayer in it is equal to a thousand. Greeting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the muajaha and praying in a rawda are all things that we look forward to and inshallah will be facilitated for you by the wonderful services that you will always be provided inshallah with good intentions by our ground staff of Dar es Salaam. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carries you there in comfort and humility and in ease. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us al-qabool and many, many, many more returns. Allahumma ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfill for you all of the dreams that you have in this umrah that is upcoming and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you tawfiq and barakah bi idnillahi ta'ala subhanakallahumma bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk and i look forward to taking a, a few minutes of questions and answers if there are any that you feel are necessary to be asked now or you can maintain them with you uh, inshallah until upcoming sessions uh, that you will have, especially as you arrive into Medina, inshallah. Now, there are a few Q and A's that I see here. Okay, it says, I understand it's a sunnah to pray two rak'ahs nafl in the rawda. Will it be allowed for a sister who is on her menstrual to visit the rawda and walk through and not pray the two rak'ah? All right, so let me um, let me uh, clarify that. Uh, there is no particular sunnah that says to pray in the rawda. There's no hadith that makes mention of this. And there is uh, the superiority of praying in any part of the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ is equal to praying to others. What is superior is praying closer to the imam leading the prayer. So the imam leads from the rawda currently. They lead from where the prophet used to lead the prayer. So the desire is to come as close to the imam as possible for the brothers and for the sisters to pray in a place where they are not um, 
in, in the way or uh, injurious to others, may Allah reward it for, uh, for you. Now, what I will say to you, my dear sister, is while you're in your menstrual state, you are able to enter and pass through the masjid. Uh, I would ask you not to take the place of somebody who is in the rolda, as it does get very packed, because in the fulfillment of their prayer, it may be easier for you to gain greater, greater reward if you pass on that opportunity for somebody else, inshallah. Uh, number two, what are the rulings regarding wearing clean and new footwear during tawaf and sa'i due to certain foot problems? Is it permissible? It is permissible, Sister Atika, whether you have foot problems or not. And it's a normal custom that you will see people who are regular in making their umrah and tawaf. I, for example, carry a pair of um, slippers, uh, good cushioning, because the marble floor can be a little bit tough. Uh, it is um, better if you are able to experience the tawaf, inshallah, uh, where you are comfortable. Your ibadah is in a higher state. So if you know that you have back problems or foot problems, wear footwear that is destined just for the Masjid al-Haram, uh, or footwear that you've cleaned for that purpose, and there is no problem with that, inshallah. It does not diminish any of your reward. All right, we have another question. My father-in-law has digestive problems and is going through chemotherapy. Can he wear a diaper during the umrah and have it still to be valid? So what I would say, inshallah, is he is to wear it if it is an essential. So if it is something that is necessary, uh, yes. If it's something that has to be a closed up diaper and so on, yes, inshallah, there is no harm in that if there is a medical need and something that is urgent, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow him to complete his umrah in khayra and in barakah. May Allah accept for him this long journey that he will make. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow him to find comfort in fulfilling the umrah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send those who will assist him all throughout the way Allahumma ameen. Can we wear deodorant if applied before the miqat and the niyyah? Yes, absolutely. Not can you. You should wear a deodorant. And I also recommend that you buy deodorant that is odorless, that you can apply even after you have made your miqat and niyyah, inshallah. Uh, there are uh, a number of different brands that you can find that are unscented and that are perfume free, inshallah. Um, are sunglasses allowed? Absolutely, sunglasses are allowed. And if you're in the daytime, I highly recommend them, inshallah. Can we do nafl after fajr and after asr in Masjid al Nabawi and Masjid al Haram? Also, can we do tahiyyat al Masjid in Masjid al Nabawi and Masjid al Haram? You should do tahiyyat al Masjid in the Prophet's Masjid. Your tahiyyat of al Masjid al Haram is making tawaf. It is recommended for us not to do prayer when the sun is rising and as it's nearing setting. So for about 30 minutes after Salatul Fajr, it's the time of the sunrise. You are asked not to do uh, prayers. This is a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And for the 30 minutes right before sunset, you should not be doing any voluntary prayers. Other than that, you are welcome to, inshallah. So as the sun is declining and it's the last 20, 30 minutes, better not to. Uh, and you will gain the reward of fulfilling the sunnah for that, inshallah, bi-idhnillahi uh, ta'ala. The tahiyyah of al-Masjid al-Haram is not to rak'ah, but it is to do tawaf, which is what I would recommend for you to do, inshallah. Make as many tawaf as you can, which is seven circuits around and two rak'ah thereafter. So the two rak'ah comes with the tawaf, inshallah. Can women cut more than one centimeter of their hair? Yes, you may cut more than one centimeter of your hair. Uh, please, please, I need this webinar in written form. Okay, um, you will receive, inshallah, and there's lots of things that will be provided for you. MashaAllah, you are in wonderful, wonderful, good hands with Dar es Salaam. You're going to have an incredible journey and incredible instructors along with you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you tawfiq and barakah. Allahumma ameen. Also, this is a recorded session. You'll be able to listen to it later, inshallah. What happens if you pass gas during your tawaf and sa'i? Your tawaf, inshallah, 
Uh, if you are able to redo your wudu, even at one of the Zemzem stations, just make your wudu, that would be better. If you are not, your tawaf is accepted. You begin your tawaf in wudu, but it is accepted for you, inshallah. It is better for you to make and refresh your wudu, uh, but it, it will not ruin the overall reward. As for sa'i, uh, it is not a, a necessity to be in a state of wudu uh, for sa'i, according to the majority opinion, but it is preferred. But once again, I will say to you that even if you step out to make your wudu or you go to the Zemzem stations, they have you know little uh, troughs there where as you make your wudu, the water will fall into the drain. It's an easy process. It's one of the first things that I would, uh, I normally teach when we are on our way to Mecca. I teach people how to make wudu using the cups. Get somebody to help you or you can make it yourself. Uh, I will do, inshallah. All right. Want to clarify. So during the seven rounds of tawaf, we only glorify Allah and not make any dua at this time, but make dua for yourself and others during the sa'i. Uh, it's not during the sa'i. And I'm not saying you can't make dua. I'm saying the dua that you should prefer and that you should increase in is the dua of honoring Allah, reading from the Quran, praising Allah Azza wa Jal, um, you know, uh, and making dua for yourself. Allahumma khilli. No problem with that, inshallah. But a lot of people get really busy where they're just making dua, 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 and asking and asking and asking. And really, the essence of it is as you are making your tawaf, you are fixated on the magnificence of Allah. So I usually lead uh, my group with the tasbih that when they know and, and contemplating its words. And you're able to speak to other people in your tawaf. And I highly recommend, subhanAllah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. La ilaha illa ant. You know, making uh, the dua that honors Allah and magnifies Allah. And you are allowed to ask for things for yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. But take it as an opportunity of magnifying Allah. And then when you are standing on Safa, that is where the Prophet spent time making dua. That is where now, O oh Allah, I have come, I have made my tawaf. Oh Allah, I ask you for my needs. I ask you for my future. I ask you to forgive my past. I ask you to protect my family, my children, my loved ones, my rizq. This is where you pour your heart out, heart out to Allah, the way Hajar poured her heart out to Allah, the way our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam poured his heart out. What should I do if I forget the number of count of tawaf? It's a good question. Uh, always build on what you are certain of. So if you are sure you did five, but it could have been six, then assume it was five. What you are certain of is the one you count by. And you will, you know, you, you can count on your beads. There are little beads that have seven notches in it. You can purchase them for one rial, inshallah, uh, and they will be offered to you in Al Medina. And as you go by every thought, you just put one of the beads up so you count the seven or make note of it on the counter on your mobile phone, uh, the Tawakkalna app or the app that you're asked to download uh, has a, a, a tawaf counter in it for you, inshallah. Or just, you know, make a, a small indication on your watch or whatever it is to make note of that. It's usually something that will be, um, uh, uh, that does happen that people are unsure and they want to be extra cautious don't let the West Wessa get a hold of you. If you were sure it's six, it's six. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all over aware of our intentions. Is my father-in-law able to use the restroom during the Umrah? Does that break his ihram? The, you, it does not break your ihram. You are going to need to use the restroom many times. You can have a shower. You can have a cleansing. And especially if um, after your journey from Medina, have a complete shower. Get him freshened up get him ready and yourself inshallah, and then head down to the Umrah. If halfway during your Umrah, if after the tawaf, which you will finish within, an, you know, within 30 to 40 minutes, maybe an hour at the most, if it's really packed, once you're done that, as you get to Safa and you do your first leg right outside the doors of Marwa, our bathroom. So you can go take a little bit of a visit there, do the bathrooms. And if you communicate this with the ground team and the, and the imam who is with you, he will be able to assist you with that and facilitate it, inshallah. You can step out of the haram, 
go to the restrooms, come back, they're clean and they're, they're you know, and then you will join again back from Al Marwa. You don't have to restart everything and you will continue number two on your way back, inshallah. Any particular dua for each corner of the Kaaba that is recommended. There is no particular dua noted from the Prophet ﷺ in the corners of the Kaaba except Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al as he approached the black stone, inshallah. Any particular duas, uh, uh, nothing that is recorded from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. For men, can I cut my own hair like smaller than an inch? Yes, absolutely. You want to take from all parts of your hair. So you're not just going to cut from the side, but it has to be from all parts of the head for men, inshallah. All right, uh, just for clarification, in these times of COVID, are, uh, uh, are masks permissible without penalty? Yes, masks are permissible without penalty. There will be a few people wearing them, um, uh, inshallah. Uh, my, my father can walk well, but his feet hurt a lot without shoes during sa'i and during ka'a. Can he wear some form of padding on his feet? Yes, absolutely. Uh, make sure that you have something clean or something that's new that's not worn except for that purpose, inshallah. On a side note, they have expanded the car facilities for tawaf. So there are numerous opportunities as you enter. As you're about to begin the sa'yu, you will see gentlemen seated there who will tell you if you would like to take an electric scooter to finish the seven circuits of sa'yu, which is acceptable, inshallah, if one has a need. There are also people who push wheelchairs if you are uh, tired and unable to complete it on your own. Is there uh, a sunnah to read at least 40 fard in Medina? Uh, there is no sunnah to read 40 fard. If you do and are there for that opportunity and you're there for that length of time, uh, inshallah, may Allah reward you for it. But there is not an authentic hadith that speaks about this. There are statements, but they are not attributed to the Prophet ﷺ with authenticity. Can you make multiple umrah and how does this affect our ihram? So once you've exited ihram, you will need to make a new albiya, a new ihram, and you would go out of the sanctuary of Mecca to an area called at tanim or when you visit Arafah, you can do your ihram once again from there. You will put on your ihram again and make your talbiyah Insha'Allah. So yes, you are able to do more than one Umrah during the trip. I do ask you to communicate that with the support staff. They will tell you how to do it. If you want to do it on your own, you will take a taxi out to Masjid Aisha. It's about 60 riyal going and coming. It's about $25 uh, US uh, going and coming. You don't even have to get out of the car. You have your ihram. They will take you to outside the boundary of the Haram of Mecca. You will say, لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ بِالْعُمْرَةِ If you are making it on behalf of a, a, a relative who's deceased, you will mention their name, لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ بِالْعُمْرَةِ عَنْ On behalf of, and you will mention the name of the person. For someone who is blind, may he wear clothes, toes, sandals for the umrah for protective purposes. Yes, absolutely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them ease and make it a blessed, blessed umrah. Allahumma ameen. Can I ask my 10-year-old to make umrah for his grandparents after he does his? Yes, of course. And this is um, something that will be uh, a good uh, training for them, inshallah, to remember us into our future as well. What are the steps that need to be taken in order to complete multiple umrahs? Uh, that, I, I think, is best left when you are there. And you will, you know, you will have many mentors who will help you with this. You'll be able to get into a taxi with other people who want to do that. You'll basically put on your ihram once again, go outside the boundaries of Mecca. And, you know, on the visit to Arafah, when you do your uh, monastic visit or uh, on your own, you could take a taxi to Masjid Aisha, which is the area of Tan'im, which is outside the boundaries of Mecca and make the Talbiyah come back and do the Umrah as we described. For men in a state of ihram, is the requirement still that the foot be exposed on top and on the back? Yes, that is the um, that is the expectation, inshallah. Can I use knee cream for knee pain? Can I use knee pad while doing umrah? You can use your knee pad. Uh, I'm not sure what the knee uh, cream is, uh, but if it's like one of those ones that are heavily scented and it is 
uh, that's the only one that you can use? The answer is yes, but the preference would be to go without it until you need it. So, or to put it on before you need it, before you make your talbiya. So in the hotel, as you're coming down, put it on your knees before you go down. So anything uh, in, in, uh, before you, uh, sorry, enter into Mecca, into that state, be, while you're, in, you're putting on your haram, put on whatever medicated uh, stuff that you need that is heavily scented. If you do need it as a medicine that's prescribed to you, it's a steroid or steroidal cream or something of that nature, then there is validity for that. If you can go without it, it would be better. For tawaf, can you only wear slippers or can you also wear shoes? You cannot wear closed shoes um, or things that cover up to, uh, up to your ankle. It is better for you to, uh, it is required of you to wear your slippers for men, inshallah. For sisters, they can wear closed shoes without issue or problem, inshallah. All right. Can you restate the... Uh, for the female, can you wear footwear? Yes, sisters, you are allowed to wear your footwear, inshallah. Um, for individuals with disabilities who are unable to, con to guarantee complete cleanliness from urine and feces specs, do you need to change their clothing for prayers, worship, not necessarily umrah, assuming it is a minute amount? Uh, the answer is no, that you, as long as you made your wudu for the prayer in a cleansed state, if this is a regular problem, then it is acceptable and you do your salah. And if something comes down while you're in prayer, your prayer is still valid, inshallah. But do bring it to the attention of uh, those who are with you in case you need extra support. Does the Imam in Mecca Medina do salat al tahajjud or witr as a group? No, none of that will be done except in the month of Ramadan, inshallah, so that it is not a disturbance for other people in the haram. If given the opportunity to do multi, is it better to trim the hair initially rather than, uh, that will be left up to your discretion. A lot of people do do that. They trim, then they shave at the very last one. Not wearing stitches, or is this for clothes only? Therefore, we can have a small backpack. Yes, you can have a backpack. You'll be provided. Uh, one of your greatest tools will be uh, the Dara Salam iconic. It is iconic, mashallah. Um, shoe bag uh, that will save you from having to carry other things that will all be shared with you inshallah uh, ta'ala, whether in Medina or before. If you do only tawaf seven around the Kaaba, now as part of your umrah, is it time to do dua and then after the seventh do two rak'ah? Yes, you can do that inshallah and do your dua after the two rak'ah. The dua is after the two rak'ah is uh, accepted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you are welcome to make dua in your tawaf. I don't want you to assume I'm not allowed to make dua. You are, but your greater dua, there are, the dua is of two, uh, two types. The one that Allah speaks of as being always answered, that when they ask you about me, I'm near, I answer the dua. That dua is the dua of you honoring Allah, magnifying Allah. It's not the dua that every time you ask for something you want, you will be granted it. So how do you get the dua you want granted answered is that you first begin by, by magnifying Allah and there you will find the secret to the answer to your dua, inshallah. Any special recommendations for an elderly parent who will use a wheelchair for tawaf? I assume we would be in a separate area within the mosque. What I would say to you, my dear brother, uh, is if you don't need the wheelchair um, in and of itself, if you don't want to be the one pushing the wheelchair, and it's, there is now the electrical uh, cars, you and, and your parent can sit together and it can hold, uh, I think they even have now cars that hold up to seven people. So you can have a whole group and you can do your whole tawaf and all of your sa'i in that electric car, inshallah you are also able to do the wheelchair and it is a great facility for you. You will not be at the bottom level, but you will be one level up. Uh, will it be easy to do multiple umrahs? It, that will be, you know, depending on your strength and your ability, the umrah does take a lot of time. I do prefer that you do your first umrah. If you are comfortable to do another, bismillah, uh, but it should not be something that engages your time and, dis and takes you away from increasing your prayers and doing the normative tawaf, inshallah. 
When coming from Medina after putting on the ihram, where do we perform the two rak'ahs? Uh, you can perform the two rak'ahs in the masjid of the Prophet وسلم, in the hotel. And if oh, you, there is a stop, if you are taking buses, you can do it at Dhul Hulayfa. Although the general precept is that it is not a requirement to do the two rak'ah after you have put on ihram. It is something that is uh, acceptable and it's something that is rewarded, but it is not a requirement for your umrah, inshallah. I've injured my hip and I'm having a hard time praying normally. Is it, and it's taking longer to heal. Are there chairs? Yes, and there are chairs that are mobile with you. I, I, I would say to you when you're in Medina, inshallah, buy one for yourself where it's a handle. It's, uh, you know, it's like a walking cane, but it turns into a chair quickly. Sorry about so many restroom questions. No, don't worry about that. I'm used to it, mashallah. <coughs> Can my father-in-law use it after two laps? Um, uh, after two laps. Uh, so generally speaking, you'll be able, I think, inshallah, after doing the seven tawaf, uh, I think once you do, as you're on the way down to Marwa, that's when I would, I, if I was your leader, I would uh, pass you into uh, making um, a pit stop at, at the wudu and uh, the bathroom areas, uh, and then you can continue your laps thereafter. That would probably be the best place, inshallah. But do consult with those who will be with you on the ground. For men if doing multiple umrahs, I should not change. Yeah, we've answered that, alhamdulillah. Are strollers permissible? Yes, but they won't let you all the way down. So you'll have to make tawaf up high, inshallah. Um, they may not let you all the way down. Can you wear a money belt? Yes, I highly recommend a money belt, inshallah. All right. Uh, uh, as a result of COVID, is it recommended to still kiss the black stone? Uh, what I recommend for you, Sister Yasmin, is that you do not uh, attempt to go and, and kiss the black stone. Uh, unless there are really special circumstances where it's not busy and it's not uh, pushing and shoving, I would not take you in as your group leader to kiss the black stone, inshallah. For first time is coming from you, yes, is it safe to take saxis in around Mecca and Medina? You will have a wonderful time, Brother Sabi. Samir, there is no safer place than the city of our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Mecca al-Mukarramah. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala honor you and protect you in your journey. Allahumma ameen. Can we make Umrah for deceased parents after you've made your own? Yes, inshallah. Uh, some say that if they have done their Umrah themselves, no, you can do it uh, even if they have done one themselves, if they are no longer able to make Umrah for themselves due to a disability or if they have returned in the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. Is the prayer room in the Fairmont Hotel considered part of the Haram if one cannot go to the Haram for a reason? All of Mecca is Haram. All of Mecca is Haram, but the reward is greater as you are greater to the Kaaba, inshallah. After Umrah, is it permissible to just make tawaf on behalf of someone else? Yes, that is uh, an entirely uh, wonderful idea to make the tawaf, not necessarily a full umrah, inshallah. Yes, women can wear tennis shoes, inshallah. Uh, for men during tawaf. So we'll take, uh, I think we're repeating some of the questions there. So we'll take three more questions, inshallah. Can I do umrah on behalf of my wife and children? No. If they are able-bodied and have hope of coming on their own, then the answer is no. If they have deceased, may Allah have mercy upon them, then yes. Uh, uh, do women have to trim all our head hair or just a section? So you would want to bundle a part of every section of your hair into a bundle and then trim a centimeter from that, inshallah. And uh, can we make Umrah for our parents if they have dementia? Yes, you can. If somebody is unable to make the Umrah themselves, if they are no longer able to fulfill that need for themselves, you may make Umrah. May Allah grant them purity and a good end. Allahumma ameen. Uh, are there any restrictions for women traveling without a mahram? If there is uh, someone who has taken a guardianship and an assumed security for them, that there is a relative assurance of safe travel, 
and that they are going to be upon arrival with a safe group, which is fulfilled by Dar es Salaam and your group leader, then it is acceptable, inshallah. Is it acceptable to make Umrah for two persons with one, uh, one Umrah for two people at the same time after I finish my own? No, it is one Umrah per person, inshallah. Jazakumullah anna khayr al jaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you uh, an accepted Umrah. May Allah keep you safe until then, carry you there safe until then, and may Allah return you with an increase in your khayr and in your barakah, in your iman and in your rizq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us the honor of assisting you along the way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala support our dear brothers and sisters at Dar as Salaam in fulfilling this great amana in the high standard that they always do. Allahumma ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you to remember me in your dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you khayr and barakah. Uh, your brother Yahya Ibrahim from Perth, Western Australia, it's getting to 1.15 a.m. here. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards us for the time that we've spent together. Jazakumullah anna khayr al-jazaa. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.